times that uh, we live in. I was thinking just of course over the last uh, few days about a, a program that I used to watch when I was a kid called Romper Room and uh, the host of that show had a basically a handheld mirror with nothing in the frame and she would look in that frame and look through the into the television camera and she would say and I see Bobby and I see Tommy and I see Sarah and I see Susie and I see and she would list all these names to try and give children the idea that she saw all of them out there and I'm thinking as I stand here getting ready to share with you from scripture that um, I can see you you're not here in the building but as I sit here I can see where you folks are used to sitting I can see the places that you usually occupy but the critical point isn't that I can see you the point is that as that host on TV said as God looks at these moments he sees us he knows where we are he understands the circumstances that we are uh, facing and so while I'm speaking to an empty room and I'm picturing you in my mind's eye uh, it is good to know it's refreshing to know, it's encouraging to know that God sees us exactly where we are. <clears throat> been thinking, of course, about what I wanted to talk about in uh, these next few minutes and uh, decided this morning to talk about a man who knew a little something about quarantine or isolation, and that is a guy in the book of Genesis named Noah. We're all familiar with the story, so I'm not going to read the entire account I'm going to read just a few verses that are at uh, the early part of uh, this recounting, and then I have a passage from the New Testament that I would like to uh, kind of weave into this as well. This is from uh, the book of Genesis, the sixth chapter, the fifth verse. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry, sorry, it says, that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And then one of the most wonderful verses in all of Scripture, that eighth verse that says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Father, we want to take just a few moments to ask your help today as we uh, look to these scriptures together. These are interesting times, very different than what we are accustomed to, but Lord, we understand that you are omnipresent. We understand that you are omnipotent. We understand that you are omniscient. There's nothing that has occurred in the world over the course of these last few weeks that has taken you by surprise. There's nothing that you are unprepared for. And so we pray as we look to scriptures together, the eternal word, that you would use it to strengthen our hearts, to build our faith and our confidence, our hope and our expectation. So we gladly ask the help of the Holy Spirit as we uh, think about these things together today in Jesus' name. Amen. We look at what's going on around us, and, and as I'm sure you are uh, doing in your own thought process and perhaps in your own uh, scripture reading, your own devotions and other things that are there, we kind of ask ourselves what's going on, and it's very natural uh, at a moment like this to be trying to fit what's happening in our world into that lens of prophecy, to get a sense and an understanding of what it is God is doing on the planet. You, you folks have heard me on more than one occasion talk about uh, these moments and I say God created the heavens and the earth and we have that record in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, the early stages of uh, his creation of man and already by chapter 6 of this book out of more than a thousand chapters in the first six chapters we already have the Stoa, the story of Noah and, and this flood that literally destroys all life on the earth. So what we're seeing is certainly uh, unprecedented in our lifetime, but it's not unprecedented in history. There have been other pandemics, there have been other diseases that have ravaged 
uh, the earth, and I'm sure that there were people in those times that thought the end was upon them. The point I'm trying to make in saying that is we never know precisely what God is doing at a given point in time. We're always trying to fit things onto a timeline. But the real thrust of Scripture is not about the timing of what God is doing, but the preparation of our heart for what God is doing. In other words, we don't have to understand precisely where this fits on a continuum, though that's interesting to do, and I enjoy examining that as much as anybody. But what we look at is what needs to go on in our heart and in our lives while we're doing this. Noah is a man who experienced isolation. I was just looking at the timeline this morning as I was uh, preparing my uh, thoughts for this because you don't keep all of the data uh, necessarily current in your mind. We all know when you talk about Noah and the flood, it talks about the rain that took place for 40 days and 40 nights. But then the scripture goes on to say that after the rains had ceased, the ark floated on the water, the mountains were covered for a period of 150 days. And just using round numbers, of course, that is the equivalent of five months uh, it, in our uh, understanding and, and our thinking about uh, time. But the quarantine or the self-isolation was far from over. By the time we get to the end of the story, we find out that Noah and his sons and their wives and his wife had been in the ark for a period of one year and 17 days. Now, we don't know when this uh, quarantine or this self-isolating is going to end. It does appear from uh, things that I heard today that uh, our governor intends to extend it at least to the midpoint of May, which is the farthest he has the capacity or the ability to do uh, without the intervention of the state legislature. So it certainly appears that we've got a few more days ahead of us of waiting uh, to see exactly what's going to take place in our lives. You think about Noah, uh, eight, eight people on this boat for a year, a year, plus all of the animals that they had, that they had to care for, provide for, all of the things that were there. I was thinking about just being on the water for the first 150 days, uh, having very little experience on boats other than a few small boat rides here and there. Uh, if you were seasick, that was probably a pretty difficult, pretty challenging time. But the point of that is that God was doing a work on the earth. And it was a work of judgment. It was a work that was intended to pursue God's purpose because we know what, of course, is going to happen. When Noah and his family come out, a new society uh, is going to begin, a new opportunity uh, to be the people that God desires uh, his creation to be. And of course, we don't go much farther before we have the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and so what we see is the kinds of events that are unfolding on the earth are part and parcel of our experience. As I often say, this is what we get from living in a fallen world. The world is broken. It's not the world God made. The Bible says God made it and he saw it and he said that it was good. He made it to be a place that was suitable to inhabit for all of his creation. But what man does and what sin does in a world brings about these kinds of moments in time. God can cause them or God can use them. We don't even have to be able to determine whether God is a direct cause of this or whether God simply utilizes something like this. But this is really, in a sense, a dry run. It's a moment where the world gets tested, gets tried. Because what God does in moments like this is utilize these events and these occurrences to see what's in the heart of a human being, of every human being. You've often heard when you talk about matters like this, it's not really about the nature of the challenge or the adversity or the difficulty that's there. What's important is the way we respond to it. What's important is how we act or how we react when we are in the midst of trying times like this. I'm sure there were days on the ark where no one his family felt like it was overwhelming. No longer could see any extended family or any associates or friends or anybody that they had known. 
and to live with the knowledge that when they came out of this ark, they were going to be the only people alive on the planet is a very, very challenging thought and a consideration. But it was a part of what God was doing to continue to safeguard his uh, planet and to provide for his people. We look at the world and we see the confusion. We, we see the chaos. We see the disorder that's there. We see the challenges that live. And, and as Christians, as believers, we have a frame of reference, the Bible, that helps us understand what's taking place. But a large percentage of the world does not have that frame of reference. They do not understand at all what might be shaking out in moments like this. But this is intended to reveal the heart, and it's intended, honestly, in the eyes of God to be a moment of grace and a moment of opportunity. These are moments where people can turn to God with a hungry heart or turn to God with the questions that exist in their life and find that God is an ever-present help in time of trouble, that the God who made the heavens and the earth and the God who destroyed that early civilization with the flood did not destroy that civil civilization forever. He destroyed a wickedness. He destroyed an evil, but he brought a, a, a complement of people through to continue to give them the opportunity to be the beneficiaries of his love. You think about an ark. The ark comes to represent for us the concept of safety or the concept of salvation. The ark was the device or the means by which Noah and his family were preserved. We talk about the Ark of the Covenant as we get into the Law of Moses and the provisions that were made for the tabernacle and the representation of his presence. And again, the concept of the Ark is the concept of a place of salvation. And, and, and that salvation doesn't necessarily mean as human beings we're going to be immune to the trials and tribulations of the world. And we may not be immune to the diseases that can occasionally ravage the world but the promise is that none of those things will separate us from the love of God that exists in Christ Jesus through Christ Jesus to be brought to bear on the course of our lives so the ark is that place of security the, the passage I used a couple of weeks ago from Psalm says that may God hear you from his sanctuary the ark was a sanctuary it was a place of salvation a place of safety People often think of a church and this room in the church, we often call it a sanctuary. The idea is it represents a place where salvation is offered. But in these moments where the church is not able to gather, we begin to understand that this room is not really a sanctuary. We can use that word and we're not doing any damage when we do that. But we begin to realize what the Bible says that God himself is our sanctuary. I often quote Psalm 90, the first verse that says, God has been our dwelling place in every generation. Your sanctuary is not in this building. This building is only a representation or now in the new covenant, simply a gathering place. It's a place where we come to seek the help and the salvation of God. And so the premise for you as you are uh, isolating at home, as you are endeavoring to maintain a viable uh, health and, and well-being is to understand that while we are not able to meet, we are still in the sanctuary. We are still abiding in the presence of God. And, and that verse even references the mountains, the mountains that are covered here by the flood of Noah before God even made the mountains, before he made the heavens and the earth, in essence, God is the sanctuary, has always been the dwelling place of his people. And so we strive to enjoy that blessing and that favor that God has made. And that phrase really comes down to where we are in our lives today. We're troubled by what's going on. We're not sure about what's going to happen next. We don't know when we go to the store if we're gonna be able to find the products that we're looking for. There are occasionally shortages of meat and, and that may become more problematic. We know if you go to the paper products aisle, there are shortages 
that exist there, canned goods, staples, things that will last a long time. We never know what's going to be there in any given moment when we go. We're not sure if those resources are going to be there. It's a day of uncertainty. It's a day where tomorrow is really unknown to us and the extent of time that we may be involved in this uh, may challenge us and may test us. But we are to rest in the safety and the security of the relationship that we have with God, that which is afforded to us through Jesus Christ. The grace of God will sustain us. The old saying is the grace of God will never lead us where the power of God is not able to keep us. God never abandons his people. He never leaves us to the devices of the enemy. We may suffer in the flesh as we fight the fight of faith in a broken world, but we are never severed. We are never separated. The, the love and the power of God toward us and in us is never, ever diminished in any way, shape, or form. I want to take you then as well to a passage. This is also a familiar passage to uh, most of us. I'm sure you have read it many times and heard it spoken of many times. This is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. These are the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when the world says peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that the, this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, asleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let those of us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we live or whether we die, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing. The world, as we know it, is in the process of falling apart. As I said, we don't know precisely where we are on that continuum. We don't know precisely when things are really going to break up in, in a major fashion, as they did with Noah when he went into the ark. But the world is not the most pleasant place to be. Those of us who are uh, familiar with Scripture know what the Bible says about the world we live in and about a new heavens and a new earth. But the world doesn't understand that. The world is still looking for a utopian society, even in the midst of uh, moments like this. The solutions that are offered are intended to somehow convey that sense of safety, and they think they can do that by altering the world. I was, I was reading something online just this morning about a new video project taking place that's based on a book called Brave New World by Aldous Huxley that many of us are familiar with because most of us probably read it uh, at, at some point in our years in school. And this video adaptation is coming out, and, and this is just one line that was there. It's not out yet. I haven't seen it. I don't intend to see it. The, the, the piece that I read is talking about the, the lack of morals that are there. But it says this, it says, Peace has been achieved in this seemingly utopian New London thanks to prohibiting monogamy, privacy, money, family, and history itself. Now, I say that to say this. These moments will either bring us to believe more in the vision or the world, the salvation that God has, or it will drive us to strive more and more to resolve man's problems with an attempt to return to a society like the Garden of Eden, to, to, to build that world. And Aldous Huxley was simply speaking of a world that he saw sometime off in the future. And, and we look at this and we can see it frames perfectly against the concept of the end times and uh, the, the, the time of, of period that we know of as the tribulation. 
the world still thinks that they can restore and redeem this society and this world. These pains that we're going through are evidence that we cannot. There is no solution humanly possible to what we're going through. There is no remedy that man can offer. The only remedy is to come into that ark of safety, to come into that place that God has prepared. And, and we know the story with, with Noah and his family. He built the ark. The Bible describes him as a preacher of righteousness. He was heralding the message of what God was going to do, and the world ignored that message. And when the time finally came, the seven days before the rain came, God uh, directed Noah and his family to come into the ark and to begin to prepare and to, to make sure that all uh, the pairs of all of the animals were gathered in there. And after seven days of that preparation, the rains began to come. And of course, those seven days can easily represent the seven years of tribulation that we talk about. But the other thing that is significant in the story, as we know, is that just as the rains were beginning to start, God shut the door of the ark. Now, when we come to that moment in the tribulation, or that moment just after the rapture, the indication is that will be the equivalent of this time that Noah spends in the ark. It's going to be a time of judgment on the earth. But before that moment comes, and until that moment comes, there is this opportunity for people to be saved. And so even though the church is, in many respects, in isolation, we're not able to meet, the premise is our ministry is still to declare the word of the Lord. Our purpose is still to stand firm on the foundation of what God has given us. We don't know what's going to happen, but we know where the sanctuary is. Our sanctuary is found in our life in God. It's found in our life in Christ. It's found in the relationship that we have with him. We know what this passage tells us. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. Th that day comes as a thief in the night, as a surprise to those who are ill-prepared, those who are not ready. But, but you can tell what he's talking about here because you get that sense of the contrast between the, the children of the day and the children of the night. And what does he call us to do? He calls us to be watchful. He calls us to be sober. The Bible says when we see these birth pangs or the beginning of these birth pangs, we don't panic. We don't look to run and hide. We lift up our heads and look because the Bible says our salvation draweth nigh. And so while there are concerns about the events that are taking place around us, it should never strike fear in our hearts because God is the same place he's always been. He's sitting on the throne. He's working his will on the earth and he's looking for a people. He's looking for that people who he says in this passage in, in Thessalonians that let those of us who are of the day be sober. And the idea of sober is the idea of being responsible, of, of being thoughtful of understanding where we are. And we put on the breastplate of faith and love, and we wear that helmet, the hope of salvation. We're living in troubled times, but we are not a people without hope. We're living in troubled times, but we're a people of faith and love. We're a people who have that, not because we are inherently good, but because that is the work that God does in the hearts of those who love him. The Bible says the reason that Noah was brought into the ark and his family was because he was a righteous man. And the righteous run into that name. The righteous run into that sanctuary. And the Bible says they are safe. They are saved. They find the salvation and the hope of the Lord. We're living in the moment, the very moments that may herald the return of Christ. We're living in a world that is ill-prepared but we stand as a beacon, we stand as a testament, we stand as a testimony to what God would do and what God would have. And we issue that call to all that we know. There is safety, there is hope, there is love, there is peace. It's all found in the name of the Lord. The world can't make that society that they look for. The world can't form, quote, a more perfect union because the issue is always the condition of the heart. And just as I said, as God goes from creation in chapter 1 to judgment in chapter 6, which while it represents multiple generations of people and uh, hundreds of years that are there, 
it is still a sense of understanding of how quickly man devolves or man degenerates. And we're seeing that in our world today, how quickly the world is devolving. We're not building a better society. We're building a more troubled society, a more fractured society, a more hopeless society. But hope exists in the heart of the believer. Hope exists because of the foundation of this word. The Bible says a word that is made more sure, a word that is certified by the, 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 the help and the hope that the prophets give as they declare the work that God is doing. And so I encourage you, I commend you to the Lord to know His help and His strength. Don't let these situations discourage you. Let them continue to build hope in your heart. And in these moments where you're not able to be with the church, these are moments where God is building you, where God is putting strength in you. That's what it says of Job. God wasn't contending with Job. God was putting strength in Job. God was building in his life. You know, when we have children, we raise them. The purpose of raising them is so that they become adults and they can live and make choices. My children are all far uh, into adulthood. They don't come to me for every circumstance and situation in their life. They may consult me once in a while for a little bit of advice or a little bit of perspective, but we raise them so that they can be adults, they can make their own choices, and they can live their life. And in these moments where we're not able to be together as a church, we realize your hope isn't in a pastor. Your hope isn't in a group of people as beneficial as that is our hope is always fixed in the Lord we're we're being tested to see whether we stand as adults to see whether we stand as spiritually mature people and we will do that as long as this book is our frame of reference as long as this book challenges us with truth and we live to the benefit and the blessing that God has for us as surely as God brought Noah and his family out of that ark and built a society. God is through this looking for a people. A people like Abraham who says they were looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and whose maker is God. We're not looking for a utopia built by a society of men. We are looking for a city. A city that God himself has made. A city that God himself will bring down to us. The new Jerusalem coming down out of the heavens and being established on the earth. And Christ will be established on the throne and will rule and reign for that thousand years of peace. And then the end will come and God will make a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Our hope is not in society or the leaders of society. Our hope is in God alone, the maker of heaven and earth. Let's pray. Father, we pray for your gracious work in our lives. Lord, we recognize as human beings we can be feeble and frail sometimes. We have those moments where we let doubt or other considerations uh, enter in and, and negatively affect the process by which we evaluate what's going on in the world around us. Lord, certainly these are times that try our patience. They are times that test the metal of our soul. But the scripture is clear that every one of us is able to face this because it says greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It says that God strengthens us with a strength which is beyond our comprehension. Or as Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Or as he goes on to say later in that chapter, God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, we need what only you can give. We need what only you can provide. But as we stand solidly, soberly, religiously, if I can use that word, in the scripture, in that place of reverence for you, the, the outcome is clearly established. We shall rule and reign with you forever. We will know the salvation of the Lord because we will live to enter that eternal sanctuary, that eternal presence of Almighty God who loves us and the one who gave himself for us. So, Father, we thank you for your faithful work. We pray your help and your grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.